Hey guys, what's going on? Thank you so much for watching today. Welcome to another Prehistoric Kingdom video. This is, of course, the early access version of Prehistoric Kingdom. That means that if you have not yet gotten your hands on the game, you are able to now. It's actually been out for a little while. I took a little trip to uh, Florida, as most of you guys know, and then unfortunately got sick and have been under the weather, and so I'm a little behind on videos, but we're back in Prehistoric Kingdom, and I am very, very excited. Today we are building for the Triceratops and I am utilizing a lot of the inspiration that I got from my trip to Florida in this build. Primarily some inspiration that I got from Disney's Animal Kingdom. But before we get into detail about what we're building today, I want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Jam City, for making this possible as well as a special thank you to Universal Studios Licensing. You can download Jurassic World Alive for free using the link below on any mobile device or tablet. Be sure to stick around for just a few more moments as I'll also be talking about how you can enter for a chance to win your very own trip to Universal Parks and Resorts in Hollywood or Orlando. Jurassic World Alive is one of the top AR collection games on the market where dinosaurs have returned to rule the earth and you must explore your surroundings to find, capture, and collect your favorites. Jurassic World Alive sets itself apart from similar games by giving a player a huge interaction range so you don't need to go outside or travel far to advance and get stronger. While other games might give you around 80 meters of reach, Jurassic World Alive has up to 200 meters. This means there is so much more you can do from the comfort of your own home. The collection mechanic is also quite unique. There are over 280 marvelous creatures to collect with all different rarities, including common, rare, epic, legendary, unique, apex as well as even hybrids and super hybrids there are even some of your favorite dinosaurs from the movies as well including blue the scorpius rex charlie and even my favorite adorable little bumpy once you've collected some dinosaurs you can take them and fuse them with other species to make your very own hybrid dinosaurs each dinosaur you collect is absolutely unique and stays in your personal collection forever each dinosaur can be fed, cared for, and trained with no duplicates. Because each has its own moveset and type advantage, your goal is to level them up and assemble the perfect team to take on both PvE and PvP battles. In addition, each battle is turn-based, which makes choosing the correct team of dinosaurs and the right moves your key to a successful battle. When you download Jurassic World Alive now using my link in the description box or in the pinned comment below, make sure to join my alliance, the Banana Bunch. However, there are only 49 spots left in our alliance, so do make sure to hurry. If all spots in our alliance are full, you can still add me as a friend under the social tab by clicking invite friend and typing in my screen name, simply savannah5638. Lastly, as I mentioned in the beginning, Jurassic World Alive is running a very special sweepstakes to celebrate their fourth anniversary and participants can enter for a chance to win a trip to Universal Parks and Resorts in either Hollywood or Orlando. In addition to the grand prize, there are additional prizes to be won like physical mystery boxes with Jurassic World branded items and Jurassic World Alive in-game rewards. There is a Gleam link down below in the description box with details on how to enter as well as full details and rules. Now let's get back to what we're building today. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I drew a lot of inspiration from Disney World, specifically the Tiki Room. So if you guys have not been to the Enchanted Tiki Room in Walt Disney World in Florida, the beginning queue or the waiting area really, because you just wait for the doors to open and then you all file in, is this kind of curved section around a garden that has, I think they're like tiki heads and stuff that talk um, the different like Hawaiian gods I think is what they're meant to be. Um, I actually forget now because when we were there last we were first and so I was like all the way up against uh, the entrance area and I wasn't really watching what was going on but I got the idea for this kind of shape as well as this fence. It's kind of directly taken from that first entrance area as we were sitting. I took a picture of the underside of that kind of covered waiting area and it had lots 
lots of logs and ropes holding things together, lots of plants, hanging lights, all that kind of stuff. Now, I didn't go too in depth on detail as far as like adding the lights and like, you know, plants underneath and all that kind of stuff. Prehistoric Kingdom is absolutely a blast to build in and I've actually really dove kind of deep into creating a few things. I have a couple more builds in the works but boy is it time consuming because you're able to scale everything. I feel the need to create custom everything basically like I don't want to use any of the fences I don't want to use any of the prefabs I just want to build and make everything myself which is great and I'm very happy with all the results so far but it's very time consuming and considering that this is just you know to look pretty we're not really playing the game just yet uh, I wanted it to look pretty from the outside and not necessarily from the inside so I didn't spend a whole lot of time adding a bunch of extras on the inside of this little walkway but this is meant to just be one of the viewing areas of this little habitat. The other viewing area is continuing along the path and getting a uh, another sight line to like a big open area for the Triceratops. I believe I mentioned we're building for the Triceratops, right? <laughs> I actually placed a Nasutoceratops down first and that's what you can see kind of wiggling on the platform pieces over there because the Nasutoceratops is relatively the size of a human. So if you go into the hatchery, there'll be like a little scale next to each dinosaur, which shows you how big they are in comparison to a person. And the Nasutoceratops is pretty much the height of that little scale. So I was actually using him as a scale uh, marker to make sure I was not building too big or too small. Uh, Prehistoric Kingdom has that same problem for me where I'm actually tend to build on the smaller side because I'm used to building like zoo habitats, obviously Planet Zoo being another one of the games that we play here on the channel. And dinosaurs are a lot bigger than any sort of extant animal that we build for in Planet Zoo. And so I'm having to adjust my scaling just a little bit. But anyway, that's what I'm using the Nasutoceratops for. And then this little curved section, as I was saying uh, a little bit earlier, is the first viewing area. And we're going to give them a little bit of a uh, water area, a little pond for them to get into. And then it'll go up into kind of a more open area um, on the other side of the habitat. I really utilized a lot of inspiration of like rhino habitats for this one, as well as elephant habitats. I'm kind of equating the Triceratops to kind of like a much bigger rhino, because uh, I feel like if if they were going to be in zoos, if we were going to have them, you know, in real life and care for them and everything, uh, that that would be kind of similar to how they would need to be kept, right? They would be probably pretty destructive because they'd probably just, you know, walk on everything, rub their horns on everything. Um, and so the foliage throughout the habitat ends up being pretty light and sparse, really just decorating in areas that uh, they won't frequently walk. But I do take some time and do some pace lines in this habitat with the sand to show you where the Triceratops are going to be walking uh, more often than not, and then using the foliage to kind of designate the areas where they might not be walking. But we'll get a little bit more into that when we actually make uh, or get into the habitat part. Right now we are still working on this little walkway. I will say the one thing that I did cut out is you guys on the very beginning me using the same circular symmetry trick that these building games were very used to um, but the one thing that we don't have is like the multi-select option you can click and drag and draw a box but it doesn't actually select any object which is a bit of a bummer and so when I actually did the circular symmetry everything was all in one group so I had to manually piece by piece delete every single item that was on the opposite side of the circle than what I wanted the uh, habitat or the walkway to be made of. So I cut that out because it was very time consuming and uh, not very fun to watch. But in the end, I'm happy with the result. And hopefully, you know, going forward, eventually they will add uh, that because the mechanics are there. I just don't think that they've fully fleshed that out yet. But moving on to the inside of the habitat, we're starting their little pond here and I'm using my tried and true 
trick of concrete to make it look like it's actually a poured concrete pond, something that they could drain and keep clean for the dinosaurs. I completely forgot to add a drain in the bottom of this, so just pretend that somehow the water drains and uh, it's a little bit more realistic that way. I do feel a little silly referencing realism when it comes to building dinosaur habitats, but we're going to go with it because that's just kind of the style that I like to try and build in, even though obviously dinosaurs are not kept in real life because they're all extinct. Uh, but that's where I get the kind of... Um, uh, references from the different uh, in, in real life animals, extant animals, living animals, uh, and kind of build off of that. So I mentioned the Triceratops. I was really looking at a lot of like rhinos. For some of the sauropods, sauropods, I would probably use like elephants, maybe even giraffes or something like that. Um, and then kind of just go from there. So as far as looking for reference pictures, that's kind of what I spent a lot of time Googling. Now you can see we have a little Triceratops in the habitat right now because now I want to scale things off of her and not necessarily off of like a guest height because we're getting to the inside portions. But first I wanted to make sure that again, uh, referencing quote unquote realism, uh, some way to keep this animal inside this habitat. So I imagine that with such big and such powerful animals, if we're not building them like a complete pit in the ground that they just can't climb out of or can't break the walls of, that we'd be using some sort of hot wire or some sort of secondary fence to make sure that they stay in the habitat. So that's exactly what this is. So we make this out of the metal beams and it kind of just surrounds the entire front facing portion of the, of the habitat just to make sure that they don't get anywhere close to trying to escape the habitat. The way these would work is the animal would obviously investigate once, maybe twice even, figure out that it's a very uncomfortable shock, and then they generally don't test it after that. So that's kind of the point of the hot wire. It's not like the animal's getting shocked every single day or walking up multiple times. They pretty are smart. So they, uh, they're they pretty smart is what I meant to say. The animals are pretty smart. They do kind of figure it out, but that is the method that I would uh, think that you would want to use with um with prehistoric animals, although hot wire is kind of, kind of more of an old school uh, way of keeping animals contained. And I believe a lot of zoological facilities are moving away from it and creating more like naturalistic uh, and getting creative in the way that they kind of hide their barriers. Uh, but for prehistoric animals, I think that it would be a good option because you'd really want to make sure these ones don't get out with how big and powerful they are. On the inside of the habitat, as you can see here, we are adding some kind of raised planters using those logs to kind of surround these little sections of where I'm gonna put trees and other foliage and stuff like that. Again, just as a little bit of a protection to make it so the animal doesn't have access to rubbing its horns on the trees, pushing them over, destroying the foliage in any way, that kind of stuff. So I take that same thing and kind of sprinkle them throughout out the habitat just to make it look not so plain um, because the thing with rhino habitats and you know other large uh, mammal habitats like that is they do relatively end up pretty plain uh, just because there's not a lot inside the habitat uh, on account of them being so destructive and the fact that you know rhinos and stuff like that live in open grasslands and they really don't they don't really need a lot right they need a little bit of shade and, and water and places to graze but it's mostly like low-lying grasses and stuff like that um, so their their habitats end up being pretty plain now moving on to the little backstage area of this building uh, or of this habitat. This building does not get an interior, so don't get your hopes up. I still still do not like doing interiors, but I wanted this habitat to basically have a way that the dinosaurs get in and out and a backstage area where the keepers would need to take care of them and a way for the keepers to get in and out of the habitat as well. So I come up with this little building here and I actually steal the locking mechanism from this prefab from one of the uh, prefabs that the devs made because I think it looks 
absolutely phenomenal. So I'm just stealing some uh, little framing pieces and then with the magic of that scaling tool, just kind of shrinking everything down and making sure that it fits. So these are meant to be big slide open doors and then the locking mechanism on the front of it would help obviously keep the doors open and or closed, whatever you know orientation they're in. And then this would be where the triceratops would go into the back and you know be off exhibit, get medical stuff done, whatever they need to do uh, when they're off exhibit. I end up sizing this entire thing up just a little bit because I did make it a little bit on the small side, but overall pretty happy with, I mean, how relatively simple this little building is. I think it, it does the job uh, that it needs to do. But that's one of the great things about Prehistoric Kingdom and that scaling tool is that not only are individual objects able to be scaled, but entire groups are able to be scaled. So most oftentimes I use it with fences. If I create a fence that's a little too small, a little too big, I just can select the entire thing and scale it up or down and adjust it slightly instead of having to adjust every individual piece to make it better look uh, the scale that it needs to be. And I absolutely love it. But again, it just means that the perfectionist in me is constantly trying to make things as best as they can be. And it is pretty time consuming. We're moving on to what I'm going to call like the main section of the habitat. It ends up being relatively African looking, again, on account of using Rhino uh, reference pictures as my references, but we go with the very typical raise the habitat up in the back and have it gradually slope down towards the guests. That way you get a better sight line of the animals uh, as you are watching them from the guest viewing areas. It kind of keeps the animals in sight at all times, and that way the guests get a better viewing experience experience. Working with the terrain tools, I really do like them, but there are a couple little bugs that I have run into in that when I modify the terrain around some of the foliage that is placed, it kind of tends to raise the foliage all the way up level with the terrain again, and then I have to sink it back down, um, which I believe uh, will be something that they fix, but it's something that I have, uh, I've just noticed in that if I raise the terrain, it doesn't kind of just raise around, uh, like it'll raise around the rocks, it'll raise around the concrete that we place, but the trees tend to pop up uh, to the top, which is kind of a bummer, um, but easy workaround. I just need to learn to put foliage in at the very end, but I don't like my habitats until they have a lot of foliage because I like that contrast of greenery in them. So I tend to add foliage pretty early on just so I can get an idea of what the habitat is going to look like. The majority of this habitat is going to be uh, sand and just a little bit of foliage like I mentioned in the beginning, but I'm utilizing these rocks to make a little bit of a tiered system. If you uh, are tiered uh, enclosure, not system, uh, <laughs> just to make sure that the dirt that's all pushed up in the back over time, you know, the animals are going to erode it away and, you know, push the dirt to the front. So putting those little retaining walls kind of um, simulates keeping that ground back and making sure that it doesn't get too ruined by the animals walking around. But you can see that I've taken the little planters everywhere and kind of uh, um, placed them all over kind of around the perimeter of the habitat to give it a nice backdrop. We utilize that wonderful, uh, what's it called? The terrain, no, the foliage brush. Yes. Uh, to make the, a very, pretty backdrop of this habitat very easily because uh, you just select all the trees and paint them in like it's no big deal and it's great. It's really nice for finishing habitats. I don't usually use it for inside my habitats because I like to individually place the foliage like you can see that I'm doing here. But as far as backgrounds and backdrops for the habitats, it definitely works really, really well. I do struggle just a little bit with the actual terrain paint though because because I feel like there's really not a subtle blending to it. Um, when you decrease the intensity, it kind of does nothing, nothing, nothing. And then it like builds on top of itself really quickly. So trying to get these really faint kind of uh, pace marks and stuff like that in the habitat. Overall, I think it turned out well. I'm happy with how it looks, but I, I do personally struggle with it just a little bit. I remember hearing that the devs said that the terrain paint and the terrain 
tools, I think, uh, are pretty much fleshed out and what they're going to be in the final version of the game. But if I had any recommendation or feedback for them, I'd like them just to be able to be a little more subtle than what they are right now. I feel like I would really be able to get that detail that I really want to get out of a terrain brush if they were just a little bit softer or had the ability to be a little bit softer and blend out into other terrain paint a little bit easier. Other than that, we are just working on this fence here, which was another inspiration from uh, Animal Kingdom, actually. I took a picture, no, not Animal Kingdom, Magic Kingdom, uh, again, from my trip in Florida. I took a picture of a bunch of fences, and I've been going back and referencing them. It's like the best thing I've ever done is take a picture of a bunch of random fences just so that I have them as reference pictures. So that is where that fence came from. And then we're just continuing the hot wire along the edge here. And the last couple things that I'm going to do for this habitat is I'm going to add a little bit of enrichment for our Triceratops because I want to make sure that not only do they have a pretty habitat, they have a habitat that is going to function well for them. They're going to have something to, you know, stimulate their brains, have something for them to do so it's not just a boring empty pit of dirt. So I uh, emulate one of the enrichment items that comes from Planet Zoo, which is basically this big wooden kind of wheel rolly thing. <clears throat> excuse me um, oh but first I do actually do a little shelter and stuff for them just some little shade structures to make sure that if they do want to get out of the Sun they can so nothing too spectacular here just some thatched roof uh, circular roof and a log in the middle to make a really simple shade structure for them. And then I'm adding the dung beetles, some of the toys throughout the enclosure, but this is where I decide that I wanted to make them something a little bit uh, bigger, a little bit more of like a staple of the habitat, something for them to play with. And this is where the scaling really, really comes in handy because as you can see, I'm able to fairly easily make a, a little enrichment item for them out of just a few pieces. I mean, that is, let's see, that's four, five, uh, six, seven, eight pieces is all this is made out of. And I can make it the perfect size and color that I need it to be to make it look like it actually works for the Triceratops. Um, but yeah, then we move on and we make a couple little signs for the habitat. Again, the scaling tool really comes into play with that because I can make some custom education signs. We dot those all over and that is, that's pretty much it. Thank you guys so much for watching as we kind of finish up the last little details of this habitat. I really appreciate it. if you've made it this far in the video and you sat through the earlier sponsored part, I really do appreciate it. It's the first channel sponsorship we've had. So I'm very, very grateful to Jam City for making it possible and for you guys for sitting through and watching it. I really do hope you guys enjoy the habitat build. There is plenty Plenty more from Prehistoric Kingdom coming to the channel. Like I mentioned, I have a few more builds kind of in the works right now. Um, as I've been sick, I've been sitting on the computer a lot and doing a lot of building, uh, which is great for you guys, but hopefully I will make sure to get all those out in a timely manner. You won't have to wait too long to see some more builds from me. But yeah, so we're just going to finish up some of the little details, like I said, and then the signs. If you guys did make it this far, I do hope it means you're enjoying the video. So hit that subscribe button. Make sure you don't miss out on any future content. Leave a like on the video below. This one actually took me quite a while to put together and I worked really hard on this video and uh, leaving a like really does help me out and I would be super greatly appreciated appreciative, my goodness, of any support that you guys can offer on the video itself. Uh, we are going to jump into some end little cinematics here just so that you can see the animals moving around in their habitat because they do have some little ambient um, animations as of right now. They kind of walk around, they graze, they take naps, stuff like that. So they're kind of cool to watch walk around in the habitats that we've made. But yeah, so I very much appreciate you guys watching. I hope you enjoy until next time, I will talk at you in the next video. Bye!